Um, so we started with some housekeeping. Um, our agenda is housekeeping, NSM vision. How does NSM work? And then we're going to talk about five cool things you can do with NSM. Yep. Cool. So from a housekeeping point of view, um, we have up here two QR codes. The one on the far left there is actually going to take you to the Network Service Mesh website. So if you take out your, iPhone, your phones and you point them at it, it'll take you there. The other one we have up here is actually the link to the NSMCon event page. We had a co-located event this year for Network Service Mesh, NSMCon. It was our first go at it. Went really, really well. A um, lot of really amazing talks, very full room. Um, and there's a lot of collateral from those talks there. And in particular, um, this is sort of the zero out of six of five cool things for NSM. When you actually have a community that's doing a lot of cool and interesting things, you can actually borrow some of their content for your five cool things to do with NSM talk. So for some of these, we will also have links directly to longer talks about the cool thing where you can get even more information. I, I highly recommend taking a selfie with these QR codes and posting it on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and then one last thing, the slides themselves you can get from the QR code in the bottom corner. Cool. Um, wait a few more moments before we uh, move it forward. Still a couple people. Cool. I think we are. I think we're good. Sorry, there's a couple of last stragglers. OK, we're going to move on now. OK, so uh, vision. Cool. So NSM vision. So like, one of the things we've realized as we've gone through this is <coughs> network service mesh can do a whole lot of things for a whole lot of folks. It solves a tremendous number of problems that people have. But you need a vision to tie it all together. And as we've evolved forward as a project, we've figured out more and more about what the fundamentals of what we're doing are. And so we've sort of summarized some of that here for you in NSM vision. And to begin with, I want to talk to you about runtime domains. So when you have a workload, you have to run it somewhere. There's some place that you run it. Back in the old days, we'd run the workload on a server sitting in the data center. That was our runtime domain. The VMs came in, and we'd have some virtual machine manager where you would go, and you would run a system of VMs on it. And that would be your runtime domain. And now, as we move forward to the cloud native revolution, um, Kubernetes a single Kubernetes cluster is the runtime domain. That's the place that you run your workload. And then running things is good, but how many of you actually have workloads that are interesting if they can't talk to anything? Wow, we actually have one. Quick, I'm really curious. What workload do you have that's interesting when it can't talk to anything? Like what? But a network gateway talks to things, doesn't it? It does, but like, it has to be configured in a very specific way. So you have to talk to it to configure it, correct? Yeah, so I mean, generally speaking, any workload you want to run is completely uninteresting if it can't talk to things. And the domain of things that it can connect to is the connectivity domain for that workload. So an example here would be Kubernetes networking. If you're in a single cluster, cluster is a runtime domain, then you have a connectivity domain, which is the intra-cluster networking that Kubernetes gives you. And that networking gives you some nice things. It gives you pure L3 connectivity to all the other workloads in that connectivity domain. It gives you the ability to do service discovery with Kubernetes services. It gives you the ability to do isolation with network policies. And you can optionally bring in an L7 service mesh uh, for that. But it's still welded to your runtime domain. Yeah, we got a term for this. We call it intra-cluster. So remember that. It'll come up again. <laughs> and so the, the problem with this is Kubernetes networking is great if you're within a single cluster. If you have microservices that have to go east-west, if you have databases that need to be available across multiple clusters, now you've got a problem because you have this really cool connectivity domain within a cluster, intra-cluster, but there's not any one good simple solution like that from running between connectivity domains. And this is where a really central realization came to us for network service mesh. And that central realization was 
Why are we welding our connectivity domains to our runtime domains? I mean, when you write an application and you have a bunch of microservice workloads that make up that application, what you really care about is being able to communicate with the workloads in your application. You don't really care where they're running. You care who you need to be able to talk to. And so it's actually, when you think about it, kind of unnatural to weld a connectivity domain to a runtime domain the way we have. And what you really would like to see in the system is you would like to be able to have the ability for workloads to connect to the other workloads that they're interacting with, no matter what public cloud they're running in, if they're running on-prem, or if they're running in different clusters, wherever they may be. And so NSM provides a solution to this problem. Now, first off, we leave the intercluster networking completely alone. Right? We do not have a CNI. We do not touch your CNI. We leave all that alone. All your Kubernetes networking, we take great care to make sure that it continues to function the way that you're used to it functioning. Um, we leave that be. So we're completely harmless to the existing Kubernetes networking. But we allow you to have connectivity domains in addition to the Kubernetes networking. And your individual workloads can connect to these connectivity domains and pass IP traffic between them independent of where they're running. So two examples we have here. One is a DB replication connectivity domain. And this one is just basically giving you L3 connectivity between any workloads that are connected to it. So you can run whatever weird protocol that you run in order to replicate data between your databases, which is not going to be HTTP most of the time. That all works. And the only people talking on this domain are things that have been authorized to connect to the database replication domain. And then we also have an example with a single instance Istio, but we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get to the examples. Cool. So I'm going to hand off to Nikolai now. So, yeah, all these nice things that we're going to show today, they're basically uh, based on several fundamentals that we have built into NSM, and one of them is the definition of network. I think we, have, I think we have a question. Yeah? Um, Maybe a simple question. I'm oh. using NSM, so I wonder how you differentiate yourself on a Kubernetes cluster, or? Okay, so we don't actually have slides on this, but I'm happy to answer. So the question was, uh, he said he's new to the NSM, how do we guys host our, how do you host yourselves? And the answer is that from NSM's point of view, there is something somewhere that provides the network service. Um, often, that something may be a pod, or actually many pods, running in various different clusters. So one thing you might imagine if you have a virtual L3 domain, and we'll see this example, is that you actually have uh, what we call a network service endpoint running in each cluster that allows you to have that virtual L3 domain. So all the things within the cluster connect to that virtual L3 in their cluster. The virtual L3s in different clusters connect to each other. And they're morally just routers. But we don't really focus on the routery bit, because how many of you actually care about routers? OK, we have two. I bet you're networking people. Are you sneaky networking people? M most developers don't care about routers. They just care about their IP traffic getting to the people they addressed it to. So distributed echo for clusters, right? Sorry, what? Distributed echo for clusters? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. But anyway, back, back to Nikolai. Maybe there are other questions? No. Um, OK, so um, when we say network service mesh, it's essentially network service and then mesh. So it's not a service mesh with networking. So uh, network service is an essential concept for us. And we have a, a special way to describe it. OK, not so special. It's traditional for Kubernetes based on custom resource definitions. Uh, and um, I'm going to show you how it, to, like a little bit of deep dive of how it works, and then we're going to demo it. So this is the first cool thing that we're going to show you. Um, I'm echoing a little bit, okay. <clears throat> so uh, essentially the network service descriptor is a, a CRD of kind network service. It's from our own network service mesh.io uh, API. Um, and um, it, it has a few, um, essential components. It has a name of the network service. Uh, it has a payload type, uh, which um, we are really proud that is not bound to any specific protocol. So we are showing IP here, but it could be virtually anything. Like it, it can very easily be Ethernet or some other strange exotic things. Like 
uh, whatever people need. And then we, we have the matches. So these are essentially label matching, uh, what we're showing here, what we're using label matching techniques. Uh, we have uh, two uh, sections here. One is the uh, source selector, and then the other one is uh, under the route, uh, which is called the destination selector. So I'm going to explain how these things work, how the label matching works. Uh, so this is uh, probably one of the first things that I was involved to, but um, it was never very, very well specified except for the PR that was supposed to implement it and implemented it. Uh, so this is uh, probably the first, uh, uh, I hope, good explanation of uh, how it works. So. Um, Let's start with the, uh, how the clients can connect the request. So this is a, a, a dump of the connection request as sent by the, the, the client. So um, I don't know how many of you know more about the details of how NSM works. And uh, we have clients, endpoints, uh, things like that. But essentially, the clients are requesting network services. And then they um, this request goes to network service manager. Network service manager finds the endpoint that implements that service, or at least the best matching one. Um, so this, what you see here is a dump. I have highlighted a couple of fields that are actually interesting for, for this discussion here. First thing is the network service name. Here it is called web service. I hope it's, you can see it um, on the screen. Uh, and then uh, there is a, a map of uh, a key and value, so which we call labels. So these are the app uh, and proxy, uh, um, app the up label is a proxy now, and the color label is red. Uh, so it seems like whatever we have here, it's uh, similar, but uh, just uh, uh, sent as a request. So this is um, a dump of the st structure is sent over the wire. It's a gRPC call, so we're just dumping the structure here and to see that. Then. Um, Effectively, what, networks, uh, what Network Service Manager, uh, actually our distributed control plane, what, what it does with this uh, request, uh, it gets these fields, uh, the, um, the name of the web service, it uh, looks through the uh, catalog of all the network services that are defined in its domain, it finds the proper service that's requested, in this case this is web service, uh, and then it starts matching the source selector. So the source selector is essentially the source of the request. Uh, the way that uh, it matches it is that um, uh, it tries to find the first, um, actually not, it, it tries to find all the source uh, selectors um, that are, um, that, that have the labels declared uh, as a subset of what was requested. So in this case, uh, um, the client was requesting, um, the client re client's request was labeled with two labels, a proxy and color red. Uh, but uh, we have only a proxy as a source selector here, so this, this, this will match. Now the next thing that, that we need to, to do, actually what the network service ma manager does, is try to find where actually uh, this request should be routed to, how to find the uh, endpoint. Um, but before that, um, let's see how the endpoint registration works. So at, at the time of its instanti instantiation, usually, it's not mandatory, but at some point in its lifetime, the endpoint can and should register itself if it wants to be found, of course. Um, um, so uh, in this case, this is the dump of the, the specific uh, endpoint, uh, which, which announces itself that it um, um, implements the network service called web service. Uh, and then it says, okay, I'm labeled with app uh, Nginx and color red, meaning, okay, I'm an Nginx application and I will serve something that is colored in red. We'll see what it is later. Uh, and then um, here um, we have a little bit of discussion how the destination uh, selector works. Uh, it's effectively the same uh, as the source selector works. Uh, it tries to find uh, a specific destination, actually the endpoint that uh, has uh, up equals nginx at least. Uh, and because uh, this specific endpoint has announced itself that it, it is an Nginx application and it has color red, uh, it has at least up uh, uh, Nginx, so it matches. So that's, that's how, how the things work, more or less. 
I mean, there are a lot of more details. We're not going deep, just like a rough um, overview of the selection. So um, we'll discuss the specific example that, that I'm going to show you how it works. It's a live demo, so fingers crossed that it's going to work. Um, yeah, um, as an effect of all this discussion, essentially on the right here you see a full, um, the full, uh, the, the, the description of the network service. This network service this is a very basic one. It essentially says, okay, there is a network service called web service. It's going to be of type payload. Uh, and it's going to select all the uh, endpoints that are uh, labeling themselves as Nginx at least. Uh, and uh, this is going to happen for every request that comes from the proxy. Or at least the, the request itself is labeled as proxy. Uh, just a slight divergence of the slides here. Um, we have um, a little bit of in the works uh, um, authentication uh, initiative, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, based on SPIF Inspire uh, uh, technologies and ideas. Uh, so this will slightly change how this works in practice, but let's say that for simplicity, we're talking basics. So whoever sends the request which says up equals proxy is going to be matched as a request and it's going to go to the Nginx servers. Um, this is a slightly more complex uh, example where actually we have two match sections. So the first section here on the right is um, if the request requests also a specific color, it says, okay, I'm the proxy and I would like to get to a service uh, that is labeled with uh, red. And then we are trying to find a service that actually is labeled with red. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not about having the specific, exact specific names here. Um, now that I look at this, I realize that probably I should have done it slightly different. Maybe we could do it version one, then version one returns red, like, you know, there are some other popular examples around. Um, so based on this, how this works in practice, let's look at slightly more interesting pictures here. Um, so this is the, the overall picture of how the web service uh, architecture that I'm going to show you how it works. So essentially there is a proxy sitting um, in front. It's a, a reverse HTTP proxy. Uh, it sits there, accepts uh, uh, requests. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit how it works, uh, uh, like how it's implemented. Uh, but uh, effectively from network service mesh point of view, it generates a request which says, which says I would like to connect to, uh, to the service called web service and I'm sending, I'm labeling my request with these two labels, sub proxy and color red. Then, of course, this will pass through the um, matching engine, as, uh, as we have ju ju just discussed, uh, by, uh, in, which is implemented in Network Service Manager, and then it will select one of the three services which are labeling themselves uh, as uh, Nginxes and then uh, different colors. And all these three are bound by the same web service. So essentially, all of them, they, they're implementing the same service, but depending on the labels, uh, uh, a particular connection is going to be established. So in this, in this case, this is the red one. So let's see how this works in practice. I have this deployed here. Um, I hope it's still alive and works. Um, so uh, I will remove the verbose. So we are sending a request. Let's see, it probably is not seen. Is it? Um, Is it better like this? Do folks see what's, what's on the screen or is it still? You can see, yes. you can see the text. Yeah. Okay. So the, the idea is that we are sending a HTTP header uh, which gets translated uh, into a, uh, an NSM label and we get connected to the particular service. So the thing that we are returning is that the background cover is going to be red. This is the, the, the web page that you that, that we are generating. Now, if I change it to one of the other colors, so uh, for example, um, what was it, green? It's case insensitive, but just for, it, it returns another page. It, and it actually, it doesn't return another page, it just connects to a different uh, uh, Nginx that serves a different page. And um, if I put a color that is not, that is not de declared, it gets red again. But if I run it again with yellow, it will return me green. 
if I run it again, it will return me blue. What's going on here? I mean, probably people are going to ask themselves. So let's see, return a little bit here. So what actually happens is that if you send a request that is not labeled or has a label that cannot be found, it will find a set of endpoints that are implementing the same service and have the application uh, engine. So this is the so-called wildcard selector that we were that, that we had in the end of the network service. So what happens is that effectively network service manager does a round robin across these services. So every, every time you send a request, it's going to do the red, then the green, then the blue, then the red again, and so forth. Uh, so what we see here with this, even, even if I remove the whole uh, header, I don't send anything here. Uh, it's just like every time it's a different one. Now to visualize it and make it slightly more interesting, um, at least more visual. So this is the, the page. I'm requesting it every time it's a different page. Of course, I mean, it's just rendering the HTML that we already saw. Um, okay. Um, so uh, before we close with this uh, example, uh, just a slight uh, explanation of how the, the so-called proxy, how it works, what it does. Um, so essentially, it's a normal Kubernetes service. It sits there, listens at port 8080. It implements a reverse proxy. It's part of the standard HTTP utils in Go for people that are um, using this language to develop their applications. Uh, essentially, what it does, when we send a curl request, it looks like this. There is a HTTP header. This HTTP header gets translated into a label. And then this label uh, gets through, the, uh, through our SDK, through the client. Um, and then we get the remote IP. We put it into the request. And uh, this is how, how the whole thing works. So effectively, what happens now, what you are seeing here when I refresh the page each time. Uh, oh, sorry, refresh, refresh it like this. Uh, the HTTP uh, proxy uh, receive my requests, which are unlabeled because you know the browser doesn't send these NSM specific labels. Then it just uh, generates an unlabeled uh, request without asking for specific color. So um, we have a new connection created each and every time. Uh, that's it from me for this. Maybe okay. questions or something. No. No, 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 this, this is not part of NSM. This is just an example of NSM application. So how you can use our SDK, yeah, how you can integrate it with... It's a really web. quick way to see how you can basically exercise the selectors. Yes? The question was, um, would you repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Uh, the question was where you've got the map, uh, the header to a label. Is that a, a built-in function or something you write as a, as a, as a user of NSM? Oh, so the, effectively, the, this is a network service endpoint that just says, okay, I'll, I'll translate HTTP to plumbing, like a connection that can carry IP packets to something else, correct? Yeah, it's, it's part of our examples repo. Everyone can yeah, go it's and just, check it's, it. It's a handy there. example for exercising matches. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, uh, thank you. An important point about all this stuff as well is, so where all of the connections that you're seeing uh, that we're performing with NSM are at the L2 and L3 layer. So normally, these type of things when you see in application uh, meshes are generally at the, uh, at the TCP level. And so the, the reason for this particular demo is specifically just to demonstrate how this particular component works. Uh, when you want to start uh, building up the inter, the inter cluster use cases like the, uh, the examples we had before, you, ha you don't have access to the, other, to the other cluster, and you have to worry about, well, subnet collisions and so on. And so this, these same primitives that Nikolai showed are the primitives that we can use to build up that underlay and provide that connectivity to those things that are traditionally hard to reach. Cool. Mm -hmm. This is just a nice visualizable way to show things. All right, so next example, uh, multi-cloud DB replication. So how many of you use databases? Awesome. Cool. How many of you would at least like the option of running in more than one cloud? Okay. So now you intrinsically kind of have a problem because your data lives somewhere. And you got to be able to get your data to where you actually want to use it. 
Um, but most databases don't actually use HTTP for their synchronization for data re replication. They use some bespoke protocol on top of IP. So here's the basic use case. <clears throat> You've got you know, <clears throat> Azure, Google Cloud, AWS, and maybe even something on-prem. And you've got some MySQL database pod in each of your clusters on those particular public clouds. <clears throat> and what you really want, the network service that represents the thing that you want is, you want these database pods, and only these database pods, to be able to do replication securely between them. And so the way this ends up looking in network service mesh is we have a very simple example of a network service that you can use to do this. We call it the virtual layer three or the VL3 domain. So how many of you guys remember that in Kubernetes every pod can talk to every other pod with an IP address over L3? So this is exactly the same principle except in this case it's every pod that is connected to that connectivity domain no matter where they're running they can be a completely different cloud providers. And the way you actually do this if you're deploying the database pod is very simple. You simply add a very simple annotation that says, I would like the network service, VL3 service. You ask for what you want by name. Now please note, this is just an example. You can have any kind of a network service that meets your needs. So what ends up happening under the covers, and this gets to your excellent question before, is that you have communication that goes on between the network service registries for control plane pieces, and then in every single cluster, you end up spawning a virtual L3, which you can literally just think of as a router that's willing to dynamically accept virtual wire connections from workloads as they ask to access this service in a particular cluster, and that can string virtual wires to its peers to route them traffic. And this is all handled by the network service mesh data plane. It dynamically negotiates any necessary tunnel types. It deals with problems about figuring out where these things are and how they come together. There's a lot of magic that happens under the covers. Typically speaking, that magic is going on though with very simple APIs. You know, we've got a very small number of APIs. They're very, very simple. And so literally, your database pods come up. They both say they want to connect to the VL3 service. And now, if I were to do something like in Google Cloud, run a book info app, I'd like it to be doing its read from a local slave, because that's going to go a lot better for me. But I might have my master off in AWS. And so I may be writing data to the database in AWS. So I've actually got a video of a demo here. And we'll go through it really quickly. So we start with having a cluster in AWS, and we have a cluster in GKE, right? So it's EKS, GKE. <clears throat> Both of these clusters start out empty. We don't have anything running on them. And we've got the cube config variable. So we deploy to the network service mesh infrastructure. Network service mesh is an infrastructure. It, as far as Kubernetes is concerned, it's an app. Um, but it's a layer of infrastructure you can put on top of any Kubernetes. It gets installed, doesn't take very long to install it. So we install it on cluster one. Then we go ahead and install it on cluster two. So you wait for it to come up and be ready. Essentially, this is just pods getting downloaded and coming up. Cluster one and cluster two, now it's up and going. You deploy the virtual L3 service. Um, this is just a CRD. It is exactly like what Nikolai just showed you. It's got a name. It has some matches, that kind of stuff. And now what you want to do is deploy your database pods. So you go deploy your MySQL database pods on cluster one in AWS. And we just give you a little information about what's going by there. You can see that it's got the annotation that says it wants the VL3 service. That means that it gets an extra interface dropped into the pod. 
that has a set of IPs and routes that are compatible with your local cluster. We take great care to do that so that you have basic IP connectivity and when you try and reach between these two databases on IP, it will go out that extra interface. You can now see that we've got this NSM0 interface that I described being dropped into the pod. And again, now you install the replica slave, it becomes very much the same game. You go and install this, but now you're installing the replica slave on GKE. So it's a totally different cluster in a totally different cloud provider. And again, all you've done is add that one annotation to the pod to express what it is you want. Uh, and actually, if we want to do to make this more advanced, we can add labels to the service so that you can see. Yeah, we can do well. all the label matching things. And absolutely. Say, so effectively, we go through here. Um, we wait for the slave to come up. These are set up to be master and slave to each other. And now we can see the database replication in action. So we're going to split screen, and we're going to show you the MySQL master in AWS and the slave in GKE. You'll be able to see as we go through that they are mastered and slave to each other. They actually are up and connected, even though they're in completely different cloud providers. Quick question, because we do have the video rolling. i got to keep going. Yes? In this particular toy example, we, we actually can support DNS over it. I can get to that. So now we're into the MySQL bits. So you can check that the slave is connected. And up and running. You can go and see the databases match between the two sides. And you can create database entries for book info in the AWS on the master and then see that they actually get replicated over to the slave. So stuff just works. All you did was add an, add an annotation to your pod and now you've got working database replication between two different cloud providers giving you two different clusters. Yes? Well, maybe I'll wait for the... Demo. Yeah, thank you for waiting till the end of the video. Normally, I'd take them in line. <clears throat> and now we start up the book info piece in GKE. So we go ahead and we go and point to the uh, product page. So we go ahead, point to the product page with the IP address. And we can see the book info application. We can see the information. This is running in GKE, and it's being read from the read slave. And you can see that the ratings are accessible uh, in the slave. And then we can go and change them in the master. And if we go back to the book info, now we reload, and we see that in the, the book info that's pulling from the read slave, we've got the three stars. So we've just demonstrated to you successfully adding an annotation to your pod and having databases that can replicate between two clouds. And we're now going to show you five star cha change to five star review and see it again. This is the one problem with canned demos. I will absolutely get to your question in just a second. Let's just make sure we run off the end of the video. Yep, so you can see it get to five stars there. <laughs> and back again. <laughs> you, you get the idea. Maybe we can take the question. Yep, so now we're at the end of the, the, the demo. So back to questions. You had a question. Me? Yes, you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
No, we don't even know what you're doing with the VL3 domain, dude. Yeah. You, you, our, our entire, so network service mesh's entire purpose in life is, someone said they would give you a VL3. You asked to be connected to them, and we strung a virtual wire. Network service mesh is purely in the business of virtual wires. No. <laughs> so network service mesh actually has the ability to do discovery of service registries using DNS to look for a service record. So you can have different domains and find different service registries. Once you've got the service registry, you can figure out who can provide that to you, et cetera, et cetera. And you can basically make the request get to the right VL3 in your pod. The VL3s are talking amongst themselves. So all network service mesh knows is that you ask for some virtual wires. All the virtual L3 knows is that it's getting IP packets that it needs to route somewhere. Um, and then the fact that you're running database slaves and that's what you're replicating is actually none of our business. We don't know or care. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is the thing you actually care about as a developer, but it, it, there's no point in polluting us with semantic information we don't understand. Yeah. Well, then if I would introduce another, another provider, like, say, second master or something, so second place, yep. then how do you go to it? Um, so your, your third, let's see, bring one up in Azure, right? In a cluster in Azure, AKS. And you would put an annotation on it that says you want to connect the same network service, the same connectivity domain, VL3 service. It would come up, it would connect to VL3 service and now it's able to reach all of those other things. Now, and when you get to the real world, we do have the ability for a network service like VL3 to provide DNS. We don't show that in this example. So you could do things with running DNS on that virtual L3, and we have the technology to allow us to multiplex in parallel, so that when you do a lookup on a DNS name, you get what comes from your Kubernetes cluster, just like you're used to, or quite honestly, whatever it is you configure DNS and Kubernetes to be, right, because you have options, plus, any DNS coming from any network services your workload is, is attached to. And so that just seamlessly happens for you as a developer. Yeah, just from a technical perspective, so all of these uh, APIs that, uh, that we have, when you try to connect to them or when you, when you use them, they're, they're implemented in gRPC. So that initial connection is like, how do you find it? We use DNS to work out where that endpoint is and then we connect to it and use gRPC to, 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 to work out where, where is that network service then that results in another gRPC request of the, of the thing that works with the controller in order to, to actually materialize the, uh, the, the request itself. And so we're able to bootstrap on existing, on existing uh, infrastructure and use that as a control in order to establish the, uh, the connections that you, that, you want to, uh, that you want to establish. Yep. So we have other questions really quick. I do want to point out, we have a QR code up here right now that will take you to the full talk from NSMCon. The slides are up there very shortly. The videos will be up there. Um, and so if you want to go and follow up and get much more detail than we have here, it's there. So other questions? Yes. So what, is this? what does this look like on the, uh, the physical network in terms of I got a network team that's got to do some firewalls to make these things actually be able to even talk to each other? So you're, 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 you've asked a very astute question, particularly when you're dealing with the problem of on-prem. Right. So in the public clouds, they've got a relatively well-defined way that these things work out in terms of in most in, in GKE and, a, 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 and AWS, when you have a node, it has an internal IP that's private, it has an external IP that's public, and so the various magic that happens under the covers can manage to, to, work, to move along with that. We know that it's not just you have a network team that has to do firewall rules. It's literally that those firewalls are going to differ enterprise to enterprise. And so the internal to how we're doing this, the system is sufficiently modular that you can go to your firewall vendor and say, you need to write the 500 lines of code to expose this API, so my firewall will let this out. Or hell, you could do it yourself if your firewall API has, a, has, a, has an API. And because what you're dealing with is a tunneling of this information, and you have the ability to authenticate individual workloads and authorize based upon the cryptographically authenticatable workload identity, you don't have to go play with IP addresses every time. You just have to say, I'm going to let the damn tunnel through. And then you can actually do the securing on a semantic level instead of munching IPs and port numbers. Does that make yeah. sense to you? Yeah, I was expecting it was all a tunnel that's being established. I have to send the firewall that once. And then whatever I'm defining figures through Right, but you, you can even set it up so the tunnel gets, the, the firewall rule gets set dynamically. So if you add a new cluster someplace new, it would be possible to set it up so that when you go to join that, 
the, the firewall gets poked by a component that speaks the NSM API, so you don't have to go and deal with your NetOps team. Yeah. Yes? I'm sorry, what? Oh, so the, the tunnels are part of a virtual wire, which means all they're doing is providing a piece of that virtual wire that runs between the workload and the thing providing the service. But is the virtual wire created and pulled down per session? Yes. No, not, not per TCP session, but per, I've, I'm a workload, I've asked for this. Exactly. So exactly what we did in the, what we did in the, in the previous demo. Uh, so every time a new connection was created and like spawn, then destroy, then spawn again to the next yep. server. Yep. So we had other questions. Is 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 Anthos using this for multi uh, multi cluster? I have account? no knowledge of what Anthos is doing. It, is it like similar to the way Istio does it? Well, Istio has a very complicated system of gateways you have to stand up and, and peer with each other and press service routes around for. We actually can effectively figure that out automatically the way we put the system up. So there's the one real advantage to coming from a network mindset is that you're used to the notion of having peers. And you're used to the notion of discovering how you get from A to B dynamically and automatically. Um, and we brought some of that mindset into what we're doing here. So no, you don't have to go stand up manually by hand a gateway everywhere and tell it about the other gateways manually. It will figure that out for itself. We have a demo for that <laughs> coming, right? I mean. Spoilers. Yeah, so spoilers, this is where we're going demo-wise for the next demo. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So yes, we had a question. We'll get, we'll get to the back, too. Sorry. <laughs> Keep on going. So, sorry for hogging the mic. Um, so you, you showed that there was a, 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 an NSM0 interface that was added to the pod. Yep. When, when you know, the virtual wire is created. Mm -hmm. is, that a, is that a second interface yes. on the pod, or is it a... So I'm thinking about how kind of IP tables or whatever is modified, or is it a NAT kind of interface? So it, it, it's a second the, interface, the and you'll actually see pod. some of how IP tables interact when we get to the SU example, because it does actually interact with the sidecar. Right. And it interacts in, in exactly the way you would expect it to. Okay. So, so there's, no, there's no modification of the CNI sort of pod network, as it were? Nope, nope. We leave CNI alone. You still got your CNI interface. The default route still goes to your CNI interface. Um, we're careful to make sure that we don't have IP collisions between your service and pod networks in your cluster, yeah. and any IPs that are coming back from your network service, that's all very carefully dealt with. And so the, the communication is purely reverse proxy to reverse proxy. Yeah, yeah. We had another question back here. We got a lot back there. <laughs> ah, so this is a really good question, because as, as we all know, as the number of clusters go, the question was, do we have to worry about pod ciders between clusters? As we all know, as the number of clusters goes up, the probability that your private IP ranges conflict approach is one, right? That's really what you're getting at. And so if you were to build a full-blown production-ready VL3, you would want to be able to provide NAT when necessary, and you would want to be able to do the, the DNS fixing parts for that. But here's the difference, right? If I try and do cluster-to-cluster -cluster networking and I have that problem, I have a full mesh between the clusters, and I've got to deal with that between everybody's different cluster domain. It becomes a very complicated problem. By having a single VL3 domain, I can have a set of IP addresses on that VL3 domain. If they're compatible with your cluster, we just pass them right through. And if they're not, then only for that cluster do we do the NAT. And so it vastly simplifies that problem. It's sort of similar to doing hub and spoke versus full mesh. And, and be, the way the network service mesh protocol works, every time the request goes to the network service endpoint, it knows what prefixes it can't play from, play with from that cluster. And it either behaves itself and doesn't try and tell us to use those, or it does and we reject its, its response, right? Does that answer your question? Cool, excellent. Any other questions before we move on? We got one more question and then we're gonna move on to the next demo. Oh, not yet. Um, now, the, the network service API is literally like three, soon to be two, super short gRPC APIs. So I, it, it wouldn't be hard. There's not a lot there. Um, you know, if there were a standard body that wanted to take it up, that would be fine. There's a fine tradition of things getting worked out in open source and going to standards bodies, and then we would love that. 
Yeah, to, uh, to add to that as well, so our, our APIs that we have, so we have like the, the top global NSM API that uh, things use to connect with each other. We also have a set of APIs we defined for our reference Kubernetes architecture that are not exposed to that top level part. So the area, if you're looking at standardization, my recommendation is to look at that top level global API because if you conform to that, to that top level API, you should, be able to, you should be able to communicate with anything else that conforms with it as well. Yeah. I mean, cool. So we're going to move on to the next example. So this is multi-cloud Istio without gateway configuration. So how many of you can figure, have you, have you, have, how many of you have done multi-cloud Istio? Cool. How many clouds, how many clusters do you connect together? How many clouds? Four. Awesome. So you had to configure a bunch of gateways for those four clusters, right? Tell, tell them how to find each other, talk to each other, et cetera. So how was that experience for you? Not that easy. So pause for a moment and tell me how you would feel about doing that between 50 clusters. <laughs> Very what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's, it would not be a good experience. And, and, and so effectively what we did for that is we said, look, network service mesh can give you a common VL3, virtual layer three under the system, which means that you can run a single Insteo instance on top of that VL3 and topologically simplify your life, right? So this is sort of showing the baseline topology. You've got various workloads. They have virtual wires that connect themselves to the network service endpoints in each cluster um, for each of those workloads. And then you can layer on Istio in exactly the way you're familiar with, right? You run an Envoy pod as a sidecar in your workload. And you've got this additional virtual L3 domain. And you have your Istio control plane controlling that. Now, there's actually a second way you could do it. We call this the alternate approach. This is not the one we're going to demo. Uh, and that is to say you could literally make the Envoy sidecar a separate pod that is itself a network service endpoint that lifts up as an ingress to your service mesh. The nice thing about this one compared to the first one that we're going to actually see in the demo is that if you have a pod that you want to connect to more than one service mesh, Say that I am a large company with many part suppliers and I have an Istio service mesh that I'm going to expose on a connectivity domain to my partners. And each of those partners wants to participate in that Istio, but they also may have the same pod wanting to participate in the part supplier's Istio. With this kind of an approach, you could participate in multiple service meshes that are mutually ignorant of each other at the same time. But it's a little harder to talk through, so we went with the simple one for the, the first pass through. But effectively, the takeaway here is that at the end of the day, you set up one Istio instance, no gateways, and then your workloads connect to be able to reach that Istio instance and get their service. And Envoy as a network service is available in our examples repository. Yeah, we, we do have some examples as well. Someone wants to so in, in terms of what happens in the application pod, this is sort of a bit of the structure. We showed you a little in the previous demo that you wind up with a network service managed interface the network service mesh managed interface for connecting to the VL3 domain. And network service mesh has the ability for the VL3 domain to pass back routes, as long as they're compatible with what we told the, the clusters using, that says what should go out that interface. So then your Envoy sidecar, in the normal way, your application comes up, it sends stuff, IP tables, kidnaps, it sends it to Envoy. Envoy goes ahead and sends it out, and it hits the route. And at this point, it either takes the default route, it goes out your CNI interface, or it hits a route that matches something for the network service mesh managed interface, it goes out that interface. And so this gets to sort of your point, how does this interact with IP tables? And the answer is, we were kind of careful to make sure that it worked out. So this is sort of the topology again of the demo that I'm about to show you the video for. And we'll just walk really quickly through the video. This one's a little bit shorter. Oh, cool, cool. Oh, there's a full screen. Hang on. So, goes through, it's installing Istio on cluster one and, you know, installing Istio. Which takes a little while. So we go ahead and install NSM. Which is faster? Yep, on cluster.
cluster one and cluster two. So we did cluster one, now we're doing cluster two. Yeah, I, I, we take great pride in the fact that NSM installs much faster than Istio. And then you install the VL3. And a hello world application, which is just something you router on. Install the VL3 on cluster two. Go ahead and take a look at the state of the clusters. So, the various pieces are up, the NSM pods are up and ready to go. The Hello World app is up, the VL3 is up. So all the cluster two pods are also up. So we get the service IP. We can log into one of those client pods. So now we're inside the client pod. You have to be inside the client pod to really see, really see the magic of what we've done here because not every pod in Kubernetes can reach this Istio necessarily. You can go through and curl and you will see that we're being load balanced by Istio among the various hello worlds that are running in different clouds. So we've strung a single Istio domain across multiple public clouds. Let's see if I can figure out, there we go. So there is again a full length talk from NSMCon that's available here that you can go look at. Um, following the QR code. There's a lot more information there. Do folks have questions before we move on? Yes, we had a question back there. Thank you so much, Gary, for running the mic around. How do you address the issue of overlapping subnet? Ah, so this was the question we got before, which is the VL3, if you're doing a full production-ready VL3, when some client, can, when some workload asks to connect to it, it will be told these are the prefixes you can't play with. If those conflict with the subnets, the prefixes, because again, we're not L2 here, you've got a bunch of IP addresses, for the VL3, then it will have to respond with something that is compatible and it will have to NAT. But you only have to do NAT for the clusters that are incompatible with your VL3's IPs. And it's cluster to central thing, so it's a hub and spoke, instead of having to do the full disaster of NAT among potentially a full mesh of clusters. Because again, we actually aren't doing cluster to cluster connectivity. We're doing workload to workload connectivity with connectivity domains that have now been divorced from having any underlying runtime domain. Cool, so, yes. So our reference implementation has been done for Kubernetes. However, the baseline architecture is completely independent of Kubernetes. This is why we use gRPC APIs. We actually took great care. So you saw CRDs in the demo that, that was done by Nikolai. The reason is because when the actual components of network service mesh use the gRPC calls to register themselves or do a lookup, the thing that catches is just storing CRDs in Kubernetes to make it comfortable for Kubernetes. But it could store them in anything. So we are fully compatible with any kind of runtime that you would actually want to hook up from anywhere, including legacy runtimes. Yeah. In fact, um, the last ONS North America, uh, Lumina showed uh, them using uh, NSM to configure a top-of-rack switch. So. Yeah. And we, we, we had a, a, a talk that went by at NSM Con where, in addition to the many, many other cool things that went by, um, the speaker nonchalantly mentioned that he had turned a top-of-rack white box into a network service endpoint in a, in a couple hundred lines of Go code. Um, he didn't even spend a full sentence on it. I was so disappointed. He was doing other cool things. He said it really nonchalantly. Sorry, what? <laughs> In principle, you could. <laughs> yes. Any other questions before Frederick moves on to his demo? Awesome. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about monitoring and observability. So how many of you want to run a production system that has no observability? <laughs> someone, someone is. So we uh, do have a madman in the audience. And so, 
Um, so we took, so let's take a look at it, observability itself. So we asked like, what is, what is observability? And so the observability is a property of a system that says how well can you determine what is going, in, uh, going on in the internal state of the system um, and particularly important when you're trying to debug a problem or, or a performance. Uh, the, there's actually three types of, observ of uh, components. I left one, on, one of them off on this. Which this so one of them is, lo is capturing logs. Uh, but the, the two that we want to focus on are tracing and monitoring. So in NSM, we have some very extensive set of tracing. So we, we use uh, Jaeger in order to, at, at this point we use Jaeger, you don't, the, the tracing system. We use open tracing and Jaeger catches. Exactly, so you, you can switch it out with whatever open tracing compatible thing that you want and use your favorite tool in order to, in order to look at, at what's going on. And to give you an example of what that looks like, let me, let me see if I can escape this for a second. So in this particular scenario, oops, so I actually have a request, and this is, uh, this is a request to a network service endpoint. And the, when the request lands, you can see the, uh, the trace request of what's, being, uh, of what's being requested. And you're able to see the, uh, the response as well. So close this one, you can see the response. But we can also trace down throughout the entire, throughout the entire application as it's going, endpoint request, uh, the monitor endpoint, the connection endpoint, are able to trace down and see exactly what is what is coming in and what is coming out. Yeah. So I mean, one one important thing that we we, we should probably mention here is that um, it turns out writing network service endpoints, things that do network services, is insanely repetitive, because mm -hmm. everybody's got to plug the incoming connection into whatever the data plane is that they have internally. Everybody's got to you know do a whole variety of tasks, and there's no point in having to write it again. So we actually have a really nice SDK that, that Nikolai put together where we have a collection of these common tasks and all they do is just expose the same gRPC API that you expose on the outside, but we're able to let you chain them together. And then we automatically will let you do the internal tracing through the pieces of the chain. So if you're trying to figure out what's going on, you can say, well, okay, um, I got into my network service endpoint and when I got to IPAM, IPAM had an error. And that's the part of the thing that had an issue. So this makes it super easy to figure out not just which microservice broke, but which SDK component broke in the system and proceed from there. And so, the, and so in, this particular, um, in this particular system, so we're able to, to uh, collect and, and aggregate all of the information uh, across multiple systems. So it gives you a tremendous amount of power of, of visibility into the, into the actual request. When you have an error, then uh, depend, depending on your logging system, it'll show those those errors in a in a uh, in a very clean way. Um, we these particular systems typically use UDP. So if um, if a message is lost, in, in, traditionally you don't want to try to to resend the message. You want to fire it off and, and forget about it. Uh, and the reason for this are primarily from the performance side because uh, the log, these type of tracing logs uh, can get quite uh, quite extensive, and you're better off shedding load rather than uh, trying to absorb it all in with, with TCP re, uh, resends. And so, so that helps protect your system from, uh, from, too much, uh, from too much information. But these particular systems uh, that have been built in the cloud native space uh, have amazing scalability and, we, and uh, they'll continue to get better over time as people spend more time building them out. Um, another thing, I don't have a, a demo of it at the moment, but we also have uh, monitoring. So, all major events in NSM are monitorable. So when you make a, co a connection request, you can monitor that particular connection and that connection will tell you a, a, a significant quantity of information about the connection on the condition you have access to, to see that information. And so what this allows us to do is that because we can see both sides of the connection, we can, like, we can send the packet in, we see on the other side that the other side received it, they received it properly. So we're not in the business here of trying to resend, but when you're trying to debug a system, it's like, oh, has a link failed? Well, I'm seeing 1,000 packets on this side and zero on this side. Well, we can, we can say, well, something's probably failing on, in, that, in that environment. Uh, we're, we also are able to use that to work out 
the overall uh, topology of uh, of the various connections that you're that you're using. So you can work out where they've gone, what connections have been have been made. So if you're training, if you're chaining a pod to a firewall, to an intrusion detection system, to a VPN gateway, and so on, you can tell exactly where these type of things are are going through. And so. Uh, when we start to get into, uh, in the future, as we start to get into the security aspects of, of NSM, th that'll help give us the ability to work out, is this thing taking a path that I expect? Like perhaps you're a vendor who, or you're, you're a, an operator and you care about what path, like I have some systems that, I'm, that I have agree legal agreements with. This is actually really important in a medical uh, industry. You have certain groups you may have legal agreements with. And some and some that you that you don't for for like HIPAA requirements. So as you're starting to as you're starting to chain them, you're able to get a list of all those things you're connecting through, and then you can say, is this is this a chain that I that I like, is that I that I agree with, and to be able to to say yeah, yes or no and reject the entire chain, and the chain is cryptographically uh, signed by each of the com each of the components, and what and including what came before that component and what they think they're connecting to, to next. So when you have that entire list of, of, uh, of chains, it's, it's very similar to, a, to a, like a miniature blockchain. You're able to perform some pretty interesting analysis on, on that particular system. Another thing, so this is uh, the majority of our API in terms of monitoring and connection. We have uh, two more versions of this, but they're almost exactly the same thing. Uh, this one, it takes a selector. Let me see if I can get that uh, thing off. So you can see on the very bottom, it takes in a, a selector. That's actually the, uh, the RPC itself. And so anytime that a state transfer, like you have a state transfer that occurs, or you have a, a, something that gets updated or something gets deleted, we, we expose a, uh, an event on it. So this gives you a tremendous amount of observability. And we do it in a way that, that does not centralize all the information all at once. Instead, you can install components in, and monitor the things that you care about. So this is really important in terms of scaling because uh, when, you're when you're looking at, ex at, at large scale, you don't want to have a central system where all of your events end up in that single place because you will, you will overload that system. Yeah. This is super important because it's important to remember that network service mesh as a system was designed to scale at internet scale, right? It was designed so that you could come in and say, I've got a workload, I need to connect to a VL3 domain from a partner of mine that I've never heard of before, but hopefully we've got some federation of authenticatable identity between us because when I come up, I'm gonna be able to get a request to him to join his VL3 without having to necessarily go talk to them. And if they have policy that lets me through, then I'm good to go. I don't have to go at every single pairwise connection and talk to humans and open tickets and negotiate processes. And in addition, one direction that we're also taking this on the observability is we're also using that as a core component to our auto healing. So one of the ways that you get your system to become more stable and more, uh, and more effective is you, is you use the components that you've built yourself. So our auto healing, uh, is set up so that uh, we, can, we, we can pull up information through the monitor and work out, like if your NSM manager crashes, you ask your, you ask your clients, who, who would, what am I connected to? And then you go ask those peers, do you agree with this? Do I have a connection with you? If you do, then you can reestablish that state. If the component that manages the forwarding element goes down, you can do the same thing. You can say, ask the NSM manager, what, what do you think I'm, I am? You check your clients and make sure that, the, that you haven't lost any state, that they all agree. You, it, it turns out that when you're, when you're talking about connections, vir virtual wires, right, or pieces of virtual wires, which is what we call connections, there's always at least two sides. And that means there's always at least two places the state exists. And so if something restarts or dies, you can get by with a little help from your friends. And those two places are predictable. <laughs> exactly. Because if you don't know where the other one's at, you can ask one. But... Cool. And uh, if your data plane crashes, so you're actually, the thing that is actually shuffling the packets ends up crashing, and uh, so you reboot it. And, and then we have enough information that we can then reprogram the, uh, the data plane and then continue moving things on. A few packets are lost, but, you, but you're able to, to recover. So that observability actually builds into our auto-healing story that we're, uh, that we're building within NSM. Yes, question. Can you configure how many How many what? How many network managers have to be always Ah, uh, so in, in Kubernetes, 
in the reference implementation in Kubernetes, each node has exactly one network service manager at a time. Oh, like, like how many VL3 endpoints? Yeah, there's a lot of flexibility yeah. there, including some of the stuff we're looking at in the future for dynamically spawning them on demand, because it's probably helpful to have your VL3 endpoint be on the same node as the guy who asked to connect to the VL3, but you don't want to do that. If you've got a 5,000 nodes, you don't want to run a daemon set on 5,000 nodes, but if you can, and we're, we're looking at stuff to do this, when a request comes in, you can say, okay, he asked for this, it falls through, the system creates it on the same node, and then you can hook it up to it. You can literally get it so you're just dealing with a scale from zero problem, which is where <coughs> we're trying to take it. Because you, you're gonna have, the, the goal is to make it so that people end up wanting to do a ton of different connectivity domains to meet their particular needs. And so you can't just, in the, 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 the long term, just be deploying things willy-nilly statically. You gotta deal with it dynamically. Yeah, and uh, one last thing on the observability. So we don't want to pretend like we know what all stats that everyone's gonna care about, so it's also set up in such a way that you can create your own metric and then be able to, to capture that metric as well. So if your data plane has something it really cares about and it's important for you to know what that number is, there is a way to expose it into, into this API. Yeah, we're, we're, we're fairly flexible there. Because yeah. we've already seen in the NSM community people thinking of things that never, ever occurred to us that are kind of awesome. In fact, quite a few of them are things you've seen demoed here, right? Stuff that did not occur to us when we started. And somebody said, oh, this is actually pretty easy to do. Um, and went and produced these things which became NSM Contalks. Yeah, and um, finally, if one of your network services crashes, so the thing that is actually providing you, let's say, load balancing or the firewall or so on, uh, if it crashes, we're able to identify that we identify it crashes and reroutes you to something else. Or if the connectivity between the services drops, as I mentioned before, we can track activity on one side and see if it matches the activity on the other, and then use that to to determine if we're if we're losing information that's being passed. So this gives us the primitives necessary to, in order to in order to build out these uh, these auto healing, uh, and we're tying it into policy. So what happens with the failure is it, is it comes in and says, "Do I want to reconnect? Yes or no?" And but you also have the option to pass it up the chain and let something above you choose as well. Until so you get to something that has enough context to make that decision on on your behalf. And so this is important because not every failure you, is, you can treat in the, same, in the same way. There's some failures where if you have a failure, you have to fail the entire, that entire chain and allow that, uh, that originating system to make a decision on what it wants to do. So, so it gives you a lot of flexibility on, on how, you want to, how you want to perform that. But that's stuff that we're currently building. So we can't, you can't use all the auto-healing stuff we've spoken about just yet. But uh, that observability is that first uh, is that first major step that we've we, taken. We, we do have the first pass of the auto healing. Yeah, uh, we have we, V1. We, we're working on a V2. Yeah, we're working on V2. We we, we usually talk about it. Every, who here has heard of Chaos Monkey, where you just have something randomly killing things? So we have sort of Chaos Monkey level auto healing, but we think we see our our way clear to what I generally refer to as Chaos Gorilla level auto healing, which is restart all the things. Yeah. At the same time and it becomes a blip. That's where we're trying to go. Yes? Can you do what? Ah, so the, here's, here's the interesting thing. You, you got to a very sort of networky place, and that's good. Um, no, that's fine, that's fine. So network service mesh is just giving you the virtual wires. So let's say I was doing VL3 and I did want to do costs on the connections that are going. So I'm a VL3 router, I got a bunch of clients connecting to me, I've got a bunch of connect V wires out to my peers, and I wanted to do costs, you as the guy who wrote the VL3 can totally do that. But you're making connection routing decisions based on the healing alert that you're going to request the cost through. So, so your decision overrides my decision. That, that's an interesting discussion. We, we've had a bunch of discussions about how to augment the selection process. So you would think of the matches as giving you a set of candidates, right? Things that would be okay to connect to. And then the question is, how do you select among those candidates? And right now we're doing a super primitive round robin. But there are a number of people in the community who are interested in having conversations about allowing more sophisticated approaches, um, and for, for somewhat for the reasons that you just described. Yeah, if that's an area that, that's, in, that's interesting to you, one of the things that we would enjoy, like we don't have to jump, excuse me, you don't have to jump in and, and write code or anything like that. 
if you can follow up with us afterwards, and uh, we can, we would love to get a use case on, on that setup, and we can make sure that what we're developing matches it. So one of the things we do in the community is we have most of our specs are, are online, and we'll post like, here's the problem we're trying to solve, and then the various developers and, uh, and users will, will analyze it and make sure that it, that it works and that we're gonna make those changes in the appropriate place. And so uh, if you're comfortable with it, having that as a, as a potential use case that we can look around and rally and make sure that we, that we solve it properly uh, would, be, would definitely be useful. Yeah, no, that's, no, no, no. That's, I mean, um, cost can be all kinds of things, right? Um, <coughs> No, no, that, that, that's, that's absolutely a thing. And I guess the, the point is you, you, you can handle it in a number of ways. One of them is the costing you describe on selection. The other could just be put the intelligence for that in your VL3, right? That's another place to put it. Um, we're actually really humble in this space. There's a whole lot of innovative stuff going on and we're actually rethinking entirely where in the cloud 1.0, everyone thought about vSwitches. Now we're thinking about virtual wires and network services. And it's amazing the things that this very simple shift in thinking opens up. But the really both exciting and humbling part of it is, is that, that we don't, we have an incredible space of what's mechanically doable, but we don't yet know what's wise. And figuring out what's wise is super exciting. Yeah, so even if we don't change the architecture, part of what we want to do is try to establish a set of best practices based upon the experiences of the community so that the community can learn together and not have to repeat the same mistakes over and over uh, at uh, great expense. So that, that is absolutely a goal of ours. Cool. Yeah, I think we're, we're running really low on time. So. When were we supposed to stop? Uh, well, it started at 25, and we, so we had 80 minutes. We have eight minutes left? So we have around 10 minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. I can talk fast. Um, plus, I, I don't think we have anybody immediately behind us in this room. So the last one, and this is another one that came from NSMCon, um, is per pod quality of experience. Um, so what is quality experience? So basically, uh, quality experience is if I got two workloads, probably in different clusters, because that's mostly what we're bread and butter is for network service mesh, and I've got some communication that has to happen, I may want different kinds of quality of experience. Maybe I want lowest latency. There are a whole bunch of use cases where latency is super important and means huge numbers of dollars. Maybe I want utilis use least utilization. Maybe I want, as you pointed out before, lowest cost, right? There are all kinds of things you can sort of optimize for in that regard. Now, when you get down to the networking brass tacks, mostly we've talked about stuff that's super familiar from a developer point of view. We're gonna get a tiny bit networky here. Um, when you talk about this in a networky world, what we're really talking about is selecting particular traffic engineering paths through your network. So there are a lot of ways to get from A to B. You're gonna pick the lowest latency way, or the lowest utilization way, or the lowest cost way. And some examples of sort of applications where you care, high frequency trading, dude, the, those guys when they tell you that two milliseconds means money to them, they are not kidding. Much smaller segments of time mean money to them. And so being able to say, I want to connect to the lowest latency connectivity network service for this is really important to them. Similarly with telemedicine, you have all kinds of similar constraints for certain telemedicine applications on latency. So how this looks in network service mesh. This, is, this picture probably looks super familiar by now. So NSM provides these V wires to connect workloads to network services. And in this case, they just happen to be network services that do whatever magic it is that causes you to get the quality of experience you need. There's a whole set of hard problems for various people to, sell and I, to solve, and I suspect vendors will in some cases, in some cases open source projects will, about writing these network services. There's a huge space there. So maybe some applications connect to the low, level, the low latency connectivity network service. Maybe some connect to the low cost connectivity network service. And again, I, I didn't want to get too networky here. We do have a whole talk that gets into the nitty gritty details of how this works in terms of quality of service at NSMCon. If you follow that link, it'll take you to the talk page. The slides are there for the talk. As soon as the video processing finishes, we'll get the videos up in exactly the same link. So you can go and watch the videos of those talks at NSMCon. Yeah, all of the talks are up there as well, with not just these uh, selected ones. Exactly, all the talks. And then back to sort of the housekeeping, 
you can get to the network service mesh IO page. There's a community tab there that'll show you how to find our weekly meetings. It'll show you how to find our social media. It'll show you how to find our code, our issues, you know, all the sorts of things you need to get plugged in. Um, and then if you want these slides, they're in the bottom corner there with their QR code. And we have the link to the full NSMCon agenda if you want to go see what happened there Monday. Um, we grotesquely miss grotesquely underestimated the size of room we would need, so it was sold out pretty early and vastly oversubscribed. So we're delighted that we got videos there. Any questions before we close? Ed, just before we go to questions, I wanted to let you know I just got all the video files. From Fantastic. Da from the so they should be getting event. up to you too soon. <laughs> we, um, Ed overnight created a NSM YouTube channel which he kindly made me one of the owners of. Um, so we and a bunch of other folks in the community. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if not tomorrow, certainly over the course of the weekend and by Monday, if you go to YouTube, search network, I don't know, if, I don't know what you actually called the channel yet. Uh, network Service Mesh. What an incredibly <laughs> clever I, I'm a man of limited creativity. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully by Monday, all the videos um, from the Day Zero event will be up on the Network Service Mesh YouTube channel. Fantastic. That's great news. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions then? We've, we've covered an incredible amount of material over a very wide array of cool things you can do. Um, so before we close, do we have questions? And, and of course, Afterwards, if you want to go talk, we're happy to go out into the hallway and talk. That's always almost the most fun part of the talk. Oh, we got a question. Oh, you guys need to sit closer together. All the, quest <laughs> all the question askers need to They're really sit They're just trying to keep you moving, together. Gary. I can see how you allow things to happen, but how do you stop things from happening? Is there a, a security side to this? So we, th that's, we didn't dig into this here. There are other slides where we've talked about it. So, we use Spiffy Inspire to issue authenticatable identity. We're in the process of integrating with OPA so that you can actually do a policy on admission to a connectivity domain. And it turns out there's a lot of stuff that's interesting in that area because it's not just, oh, I've got the identity of your workload, I want to admit you. You might also, for example, be willing to admit a workload if it comes from this cluster, cloud provider, geographic region, et cetera, but not from that one. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how to get adequate information into the system so that you can do extremely sophisticated authorization pieces um, quickly. And it, it turns out, like, we're, we're looking at using OPA, Open Policy Agent, which is freaking brilliant, and brilliant at its simplicity. Um, but but you, when you're actually trying to build this game out at internet scale, you wind up with some interesting questions like, how do you handle the authorization distribution problem on the policy, right? And, and for some aspects of the system, that's pretty trivial. If I'm a network service endpoint that's offering a network service, I know I need to get the policy for that network service. But if I'm a client looking to see, did the response I get back actually, is, am I willing to accept the network service from you? Where I could be asking for any number of network services, that gets to be a much more interesting problem. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff we're looking at around handling the sort of scale of policy. We've got a whole bunch of discussions we're having with Spiffy Inspire about federation, because ideally if you want to do this at internet scale, you want to be able to federate the identity spaces with your peers. Um, we, we, we've even bounced around, for those of you who are networking, we've, we've sort of thought about how you distribute these things and bounced around ideas around uh, trust reflectors and policy reflectors, basically just allowing you to have a way to, to just actually efficiently distribute these to the possible people that might ask for them. So it gets to be a super interesting space. But no, we're very aware this is a super important problem. So if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area on December 3rd, I'm going to be giving a talk on, or I'm scheduled to be giving a talk on, um, on identity and policy using uh, Spiffy Inspire open policy agent with a 5G context to it. So if you're in, if you're in town on that t period of time, if you're not in town, if you, if you want to know more about it, I'm willing to talk with you as, as well. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's something that we want to, to tie into, into NSM. Well, and the other thing we kind of get excited about about this is being able to have a single spiffy identity that controls your admission to a connectivity domain that can, that can be used for your microservice requests to the other microservices that you can reach over it. <coughs> Basically, all the way up and down the stack, a common identity and yeah. then a way to express policies about these things 
that gets to be super exciting and interesting to us yeah, because it opens a whole space of, of ability to connect securely. Yeah, and the, and the quick gist of it is that when you take, um, uh, suppose that you take today's policy, like today's uh, approach of security, you create a, a trusted network, create a second trusted network, create a VPN, create access control lists, then workloads with, uh, with those. And then you have to track, well, which access control lists belong to which workloads, because if you want to sunset a workload, you have to make sure you know which ones you're going to affect if you pull, a, if you pull an, uh, an ACL. But what this drives us towards is workload to workload identity that bring their own policy that reflect across the entire the entire chain, which means you can sunset a uh, a particular workload with its policy and not fear that you're going to break the other ones because it renders into it renders that policy into whether that connection is allowed or not. So you move away from the standard ACLs. You still have the VPN. You still try to defend your your network. Uh, but you, you solve a lot of problems when, when you drive it down to, to that level with declarative policy and, and identity. So it, it turns out IPs are a wonderful way to route things and a terrible way to express policy about who talks to who. So, uh, but yeah, I'll, go, I'll go into detail with that. Uh, and I, I'll see if they're recording it. If they're recording it, we'll make sure it ends up on the Network Service Mesh YouTube channel. Perfect. With their permission, of course. Yes. So, so thank you guys. See, you see what happens when you ask engineers questions. You know, yeah. Yeah. So I, mean, one, I have one last thing too. Um, make sure if you're interested in the project, every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time, we have a uh, we have a meeting on on Zoom. So you you can find us on EverServiceMesh.io and come come join us. We have mailing lists and we are very active on Slack. In fact, our users complain about how fast we are uh, on Slack because it prevents them from playing video games or something. Uh, anyway, so uh, please come join us. We, we're definitely a low latency network service. Um, so thank you so much. You've been a fantastic audience. I appreciate all the really excellent questions. And, and I participate, appreciate you guys actually participating in the process. Um, and we hope to see you in the Network Service Mesh community. Thank you. And out, grab some NSM stickers that we've got there on the back.